For July 2021, I'm going to continue a path that we started back in May. It's the first time I've done a series of three so closely related to each other. In May, we studied Patrick Lecture 182, which is the process of meditation or meditation for three chairs. And that involves differentiating between our divine essence, higher self, real self, the ego that is speaking to you now, that's forming the words and selecting among syntax, etc., and an aspect of us that we wish to explore. The reason for the real self, the higher self, is so this is a positive exploration to tap into our positive intention. The reason for the ego is it's going to do the speaking. And then the third aspect is a part of us that doesn't vocalize because only the ego vocalizes, but it may vocalize for that part and not realize that it's an aspect. Sometimes we talk about different aspects of personality. It sounds schizophrenic. Mental disorders um, reflect a normal human activity that's gone too far. Uh, so when I was a child, uh, we thought if you talk to yourself, you're crazy. So of course we didn't talk to ourselves. Everybody talks to themselves. It was erroneous to, to be frightened of doing something that could be part of a diagnosis in a mental illness. So I am not afraid of the aspect of a disorder that happens in everyone. And I invite you not to be either. As a part of 182, what I realized during the monthly meetings, I began to realize that the problem was less with the third aspect or which aspect you wanted to talk to, but a lack of ability to, to differentiate between the ego and the real self and a confusion about what the real self was. So for June, 2021, I introduced Patrick Lecture 158, which is titled The Ego's Cooperation with or Obstruction of the Real Self. So now we're dealing with two voices, the ego and the real self. We looked at the ego's relationship to the real self, which according to the lecture, the function of the ego is to support, find, and bring forward the inspiration and creativity of the real self. Uh, we looked at how we're afraid of the real self. We're afraid we'll be taken over. We see this as a contest where only one wins, which is dualistic thinking. And recently that transcendence requires a healthy ego. Pathwork is rare among spiritual work in that it relies upon a healthy ego. It promotes and supports a healthy ego. It's not afraid of the word. Once again, Egotistical simply means that the ego is out of balance. A weak ego simply means that the ego is out of balance. But to not have an ego is an oxymoron. You can't, you can't live uh, consciously as an adult functioning in the real world without an ego. I like to make jokes about this. It's like taking all your bones away. It's very hard to function without your bones. The ego is the structure the trunk of the Christmas tree that holds the branches that allows the decorations to hang. So we, we need the ego and we need for it to be listening and healthy, resilient, flexible, and strong. By the end of June, I realized that there still was a trouble with the, between the ego and the real self because the ego, when it's healthy, sounds like the real self. And so there was still confusion about the ego. It was also hard for people to imagine that the ego can be splintered. You can have a part here and a part there. It's hard to find words for these, names for them. In voice dialogue, the invitation is to just name them, give them a name, Freddie, Joanne, kid, critic, mom, give them a name because it makes it easier to talk about it. It doesn't mean that your mother is living in you or that you're a child. It means that there's an aspect of you that fee has the energy of a child. And so you refer to it and then you know what you're referring to versus a critic, which may sometimes appear to be a third grade teacher 
or a neighbor or, or some other representation. So all we're trying to do is shorthand a little bit so that we can focus on the energy of what this aspect of us that speaks in this tone takes a pers perspective, takes a position, what that is. Because what we're trying to do is unearth the agendas, not so we can eliminate them, but that we can see what's going on. The concept in Pathwork is it's going on anyway. And once you see it, once you put it all on the table, then you can understand why there's been some uh, dissension in the ranks because the agendas don't match up. One wants to leave, one wants to stay, neither one of them are talking to each other. So there needs to be a dialogue and the ego is the one that leads that dialogue. So in the second part uh, during July, uh, I divided the sections into what I call partnering with the real self, uh, that the real self has the real feelings and also talking about emotional reactions uh, an aspect of pride, self-will, and fear, describing the issues that the ego has, and the four fundamental fears that human beings have, which is also what affects the ego. So why don't I talk a lot about the real self? First of all, it's unique to every human being. There's a universality to it. The truth is the truth, no matter how you present it. And secondly, what manifests is the ego. The problem is the ego, not the real self. The idea is for you to get this part of you, this divine part of you on board to create an ongoing dialogue so that it's, it's just, it happens in a, in a heartbeat. You simply say, what's going on? Okay. And you get an idea, you get coaching, you get reassurance. I tease that sometimes my real self, because the real self is not allowed to interfere. So the idea that the ego can be dispensed with is erroneous. The, the real self can't do anything without the ego. It, it, it requires the ego just to move the muscles and get up in the morning and feed itself and take care of life. The real self is there to inspire, to help, to experience and share that experience. With the ego but the ego alone and i hope you understand that alone is a funny word because it can't be alone so it thinks it's alone and it isolates itself but it cannot be alone just like you can't take the bones out of me without destroying the organism you can't take the blood away from me without you know all the blood without destroying the organism. You, you can't take the real self out of a human being. We're not human beings in the spiritual sense without the real self. Um, so the idea is to create a partnership where the real self handles certain things. It experiences, it inspires, it, it, uh, it has a flow to it, a flow of life. It, it directs softly and gently, it points. So what I was just about to say is I, in my imagination, never having actually seen my real self, but in my imagination, I, I can feel my real self when I ask, is this okay? Does this sound good? Are we on the right track? I imagine my real self saying, <laughs> and the invitation for me is to take that hesitancy that I don't want to interfere, but I think you might want to look at this again. And look at it again. Look at the decision. Look at where I'm going. Uh, one of the examples of my ego and my real self attempting to partner is that last month with the first part, I have a tremendous sense that there's a watershed moment happening for the majority of people who are on any level regular members of the weekly online meetings. There's no proof, uh, but that's my feeling. I have a sense that something is working, something's clicking, and that there's a developmental process that's quickening among the people that I support and work with. And because of that, I am loath to leave the topic. All of you have experienced where you hang around too long. 
So my fear is that I'm, just because it matters to me for other reasons, that I'm keeping people here because I like it and it's not necessarily in their highest good. So I weigh these two possibilities. And in these two possibilities, of course, there's chance for error. Uh, the sky will not fall if I pick a lecture that doesn't sing to people. The sky will not fall if I bore you by presenting material that you think you've already seen. Like when we go on to the next topic. Um, on some to some degree, uh, if if that's all it takes for people to cancel their subscriptions or not watch, well, then that's all it took. One misstep and and they find something else. There's a place where that was probably we were probably on the cusp of that anyway. So sometimes you're on the cusp and you just fall over the edge, you get a little push and you fall over the edge. So I attempted to examine for about a week and finally decided I'm going to do it this way. Um, so that's an example of partnering with the real self, trying to get feedback, trying to get a sense of uh, validating what the ego feels and thinks and imagines and, and analyzes to validate that with a deeper part of me that has more knowing. That I have perhaps limited access, but some access to that part of me. So that's what I refer to when I talk about partnering with the real self. Uh, the second section about real self, real feelings, uh, was an attempt to explain a little bit about what the guide says when he says that only the real self has real feelings. The ego feels, but not in the same sense. I, I don't quite know the words to use for this, but it's if the ego feels secondhand. It is so close, it is integrated with the real self. And it feels secondhand, but the real feelings start with the real self. And then the ego participates and does something about it, responds to it, which means the ego is almost always in reaction to rather than generating those feelings. It can experience those feelings. It can stay with the real self and experience them but it doesn't generate them itself. Uh, when the ego is out of balance, it tends to go off with some feelings. If I feel sad, I feel scared that grief is coming. And so I do something about it. You can perhaps see that that's a one, two, three that wasn't inherent in the original sadness. So that the section discusses how emotional reactions are uh, how we take the past experience and project it into the future, which can be useful sometimes, but not always. If we don't know we're doing that, then we think of that as a device that works all the time. We don't, we stop thinking about it and we wind up living on projections instead of being able to look at the moment for what it is. And a phrase for that is to be in the now. What is true today? What is true now? because I'm not the person I was yesterday, five years ago, 10 years ago. So when dealt with a situation, I need to consider that I might be more able to handle it. Sometimes I'm less able to handle it. As I age, I am less able to handle some things that is humbling, but it is true. And so I have to second, second think, I have to rethink sometimes uh, activities or possibilities that I used to, to just leap into without any serious consideration. The third section was on pride, self, will, and fear. This is the territory of the ego. The real self is not proud in the way we use the word. It, it is. If you're uh, advanced, you're advanced. If you're not, you're not. It's not ashamed of not being advanced. It's not invested in the reality that you're advanced. So pride, self-will, meaning I want it my way. And fear, uh, the guide describes fear as the biggest addiction on the planet. Fear may be endemic to everything we do, but it can be managed. And we can talk ourselves down, talk ourselves off the ledge 
of fear telling us that something must be done or that something cannot be done. So in pride, self-will and fear, there's a triad, which is very common in path work. And so the lecture talks about those. Uh, the last section was four fundamental human fears, which is fear of death, fear of life, fear of pleasure and fear of letting go. These are all related. Uh, the fear of death is related to the fear of life and the fear of life is related to the fear of death. If you're afraid of dying, you're afraid of living. Uh, let me see if I can put it this way. Uh, it's as if you want the car to sit in the garage, you buy the new car and you put it in the garage and you don't wanna use it because you'll wear it out. But the purpose of the car is to be used and it will wear out. And at some point it won't be repairable. And at some point you may have to let it go, junk it, trade it in, whatever. If you don't use it, there's not much point in keeping the car in the garage. So a fear of death will not allow you to take risks that may be reasonable. It will not allow you to expand into the unknown because there's always a voice that says it's unknown. Maybe, maybe it will hurt. And that's the voice that fear uses might hurt. Maybe you don't know. Uh, when people talk about, um, I need security, I need to know. Uh, recently, there was a building in Florida uh, that collapsed. And as I read the newspapers, it collapsed in 10 seconds. Now, there were warning signs, but just because something shakes does not mean you know that the building is going to collapse. So even if there were warning signs, it may not have been enough to signal you to leave the building. So if you're on the 6th, 10th floor, to rush out it in the middle of the night and walk out into the street because you feel a trembling can feel a little infantile. It can feel a little hysteric. But when the collapse finally came, it happened in 10 seconds. When people say, I need to know, the truth is you'll never know. Even the sun coming up in the morning, the planet could blow up overnight. So the conflict here is that I don't know if the sun is going to come up in the morning. I don't know if my building is going to collapse at some point in the next 24 hours. I do know that if the building doesn't collapse and the sun comes up, I'd like to have some supplies ready for my breakfast. And I would like to have a functional hard drive for my computer. And I would like to have some cash in case I want to go shopping. So for the ego to function in the real world, it has to make certain assumptions. Uh, there's a person I know who is, I'm going to use the word rabid, but please understand that I, it's my personal life and I can, I'm perhaps in emotional reaction. They're very rabid about never making an assumption. Uh, I don't know how you get through the day without making an assumption. I assume my building won't fall. I haven't seen any evidence. I can't prove it but I need to behave today as if tomorrow's going to come, that the sun's going to come up. That's the job of the ego. The job of the real self may be to help us prepare for the fact that we are gonna discover that we have a disease that will shorten our life down to six weeks. And so there can be a place where the real self is trying to encourage and prepare some ground, but the ego, did I say, I don't know if I said that right. The real self is trying to encourage something and prepare the ground and the ego doesn't know what's going on. And it's, it's an anxious time period. So what happened to me is that during this time period, I, uh, I got some volunteers to, to allow me to I film, to record their process. I, they didn't turn on the camera because that's a little, it's daunting to be on YouTube. But I, I asked for volunteers and they did, and they, they showed the, the difficulty. Now, once you show a 20 minute video, uh, you may figure it out and do elegantly after that, but the 20 minute video lasts forever. So the people who volunteered were very brave and they've already moved forward. So this is old news, what they recorded. Uh, but it was, I thought it would be useful for people to see the process and hear the languaging and hear how it's not easy 
to discern these different energetic aspects. I asked for people to join in again uh, this month and I didn't get any volunteers. Uh, so I resurrected a video from 1998. Uh, so that makes it 23 years old uh, from a school that I was in during my pathwork training period uh, where we did a, some process work about the ego. And uh, one of the cl my classmates was a documentary filmmaker and so they've decorded it. Uh, the, I, I went ahead and my heart in my throat, I mounted it on YouTube. Uh, first, I gave it to the online participants to test the waters and see if I was crazy or not for putting personal process up, uh, even though it's, it's old news for me now. Uh, and the feedback was that it was useful. So putting it up on YouTube along with this introduction, uh, what the video will show you is what it feels like to be in the middle of not the first major life transition uh, and not the probably the third or fourth major life transition in a period of eight years with three to four coming. So I have gone through a lot of changes. I have literally moved home. I have moved country. I have, uh, my practice has changed. A, a lot of changes in the last 23 years. During this particular time period, I was making one more leap into the unknown. And what the video shows is how clueless I was. I had decided to trust. I was sure I was following a path that I was supposed to follow but I had no idea. When I watched that video, I know where I went and I can absolutely understand why she missed the signs and how could she possibly know what was coming next, which was a 180 degree switch and then another 180 degree switch back and forth and sideways. Uh, but I posted the video because that's what it looks like. You can be clueless. You can be doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing and not have any idea how all the pieces fit together. That's an example of faith. Faith was the lecture I was planning on doing for July and decided to push it off perhaps for a month or so. Uh, it's, uh, the lecture is Grace uh, and a Deficit of Faith. It's Pathic Lecture 250, if you're interested. Um, but what I'm trying to describe is partnering with the real self uh, requires some faith. And it requires practice, it requires skill, it requires experience. So 20, 23 years after um, that particular process work that I did about moving house from Los Angeles to San Diego, uh, this week I had a similar experience. I had the feeling something big was going on. I wasn't quite sure. I wasn't how, sure how to support it. I wasn't even sure what it was. I didn't know if it was about me or the group, whether I was feeling incorrectly or skewing because of my personal uh, affection for this lecture. I fell in love with this lecture and I haven't done that this thoroughly for a long time. So it was very pleasurable, very enjoyable for me. So let me go back for a moment to the four fundamental human fears. So fear of life is fear of death and vice versa. You can respect death, but that's different from fearing it. Uh, fear of pleasure is a way of trying to stay safe. The idea is that pleasure will deceive me, that may be in your personal experience, but it does not necessarily have to be true in the next experience that you're going to have. So what you're doing there is you're taking the past and throwing it forwards so that you can't help but repeat the past because you're not present with the new conditions that you're dealing with in the moment. So that's fear of pleasure. It's also fear of success. We, are, we, we think that we're afraid of our weaknesses and yet part of the discussion today was about fear of our successes fear of taking responsibility for who we are and what we can do. It's as if I got myself to think that I was supporting the world on my shoulders and I, I can't afford to drop it. It's quite egotistical. Uh, who would do that to an individual human being? Uh, 
but th this is what the ego thinks because it thinks it's self-important. It doesn't think it has any help. It doesn't believe in itself, but it also doesn't believe in the real self. So it won't partner. It tries to take the whole thing on its own shoulders. Um, the fear of letting go is obviously similar. To do spiritual work, you've got to let go of some ideas that you've had. Let me give you some examples. When I first came into this work back in early 90s, I, I didn't know what channeling was. And when somebody explained it to me, I, I thought it was very strange. It was obviously weird. Uh, how could you possibly believe in that? Uh, a very good teacher at one point said, uh, don't worry about where the material came from or where people say it comes from. Look at the material. If you find it useful, use it. If it is not useful, don't use it. And that it was a key for me to, it unlocked a lot because channeling is not the voice of God. Channeling comes through a spiritual filter of some kind. And that is why we have phrases such as Emmanuel channels or, or Pat Rodegast channels Emmanuel, Ava channeled the guide, Barbara Brennan channels Heywin. Uh, there's a channel called Seth that is channeled by etc. You, you get the idea. Each one of these filters has an agenda, hopefully in the best sense of the word. It has a concept, an idea. Our real self is not a blank slate. Our real self has a place in the universe. Our real self matters. What I can do will be generic and universal in many aspects, but there's one piece of what I can do on a spiritual level, whether or not I ever manifest it, that is unique. Now, it's not Jan because that's probably not my name in spirit. Uh, and I may, not, I may not know in a specific incarnation how all this adds up. The idea is that I'm working on a piece of me here because the real me is bigger. And so I've, I've got a homework assignment to do for the real self. And my ego is created to help me do that. And then when I'm done with the homework assignment, I, I might get graded and they say, well, well, we'll do that again sometime, but that's okay, come on back. Uh, the idea is that that's letting go means that if I had stayed in my snooty attitude about channeling, I would have dismissed the material and wanted something that met my existing understanding of what material should look like. But I decided for various reasons to let that go. Once I got into path work, then I got into energy work. That was uh, that was another uh, massive leap for me. In the video of my process, you will see that I, I, I have learned to sense energy. Uh, you don't have to believe it. It's okay with me. I feel it. And I have an understanding of it. One of the things that helped me in spiritual work was realizing that the spirit does not speak English or French or German or Swahili or Chinese. Spirit it's like spirit speaks in symbols and sensory information. They give you a picture that will take a novel uh, to explain, to, to fill in. And that each of us fills that in in a certain specific way. So that when I get a hit, I get an intuitive hit about what's going on, the ego does have to take over and filter and figure out what that could be about. And it's a back and forth process. And that's why I speak of partnering with the real self. Once you have learned how to partner, it just takes a heartbeat to check back in. Uh, again, when I first started the work, uh, I was very clumsy at it and I felt embarrassed. I'd get lost and I wouldn't know how to check back in. And again, one of my teachers said, take the time you need. Take a minute. If I sat here in silence for a minute, you'd, you'd turn off the video. It's a long time to just sit. 
but I decided to trust and I decided that I could give myself one minute under when it was important in, in my ther personal therapy sessions, my time, my money, my issues, that I would stop speaking and check in and realign with what I was trying to say. And what I found was it did not take a minute. Might have taken 15 seconds, 20 seconds the first time. Again, stick your hand in hot water and realize how, how long 20 seconds is. And I was able to untangle my thought process, start over and express myself. It was mind blowing for me. It was a, um, it was a turnaround moment for me. What I found was that after I got used to doing that a handful of times, the time it took for me to do that whittled down to where I can do that now while I take one single breath, not always. But when I do need a moment, I ask for it. What part of what I could not believe is people would give it to you. If you said, hang on, I have to think for a second, the sky didn't fall. People said, okay, take a minute. So that I, I found how much space there was available that I had never explored. This is an example of letting go again of expectations of a crystallized idea of what it would look like to talk about spiritual matters or feelings. There may be some truth in that, but for me to get there, I needed some latitude. I needed some flexibility. So I had to let go of my um, image. I use this image a lot. My image of what it looked like, of what it could be, and relax into my personal path. Another way to express this is I came into this work uh, through body psychotherapy, through core energetics. Other people came in through Barbara Brennan. Other people came in through other forms of spiritual healing. Uh, people came in through being social workers or private therapists. And so in my first uh, long-term uh, committed class, I looked around and I, I couldn't make any sense of this. We were all coming from different directions. How could this possibly work? But fast forward a few years, what I realized was I came in the doorway that sang to me, that got me interested, that, that filled my needs. And I went through different courses in a similar way. Now in a university, you have to standardize some things, but the higher you get in higher education, the more choice you have about taking things at your own pace in a different sequence than a high schooler might have to do or in primary grades when you have no choice. They simply say, we're doing art now. So in spiritual work, it's similar. Some people need to build their careers, build their families, uh, explore five or six, seven modalities before they finally circle around either to one they had seen before or a new one that that piques their interest. So for me, this is all an example of letting go of not being afraid of the pleasure you get over here because it doesn't preclude later having pleasure over here. It's the same pleasure. Uh, it also refers back to fear of life and fear of death. I'm not going to die if I make the wrong decision. And living is fun. Living is a lot of fun. And if I'm not afraid of using up my time here in the wrong direction, then I have a great deal more pleasure in living life, even if I decide later that was, uh, that was not as much fun as I thought it was. And we'll stop now, go back and pick up something else. It is easy to discount what happened in that initial exploration that you actually needed to make your second, third, or 15th exploration. So these are all the reasons why I, in for a penny, in for a pound, decided to stay with Pathway Lecture 158 for another month. The goal is, uh, in this particular part two, I really experimented and explored bringing in other lectures because you can read the lecture. They're online, They're, you just download it and read it. Uh, but sometimes it is hard to put everything together. So what the study guides are intended to do is assist you in streamlining an idea to get a deeper sense of 
um, some people call it the spine of the idea or the concept. And then you can go back and you can expand into it and begin to see how all the details fit together. Uh, so thanks for listening. I hope you read lectures. That's the whole point of what I do. Uh, take care.